continuing on in our series, I pointed out this to you last week that Luke 22 and 23, we see Jesus progressing right down the road toward the cross. He's in his last few days here in um, Luke chapter 22, right before he was to give his life to be sacrificed for the sins of all mankind. Now, as we pointed out last time, these last few days on this part of his journey brought Jesus across the paths of a lot of different types of people. Some were accepting of him, some were ignorant of him, and some were resistant toward him. We saw last week the chief priests and the scribes and even one who claimed to be his own, Judas, in a spirit of tremendous resistance against Jesus. Today, what we're going to do is notice how some of his closest followers, who we know to be his disciples, we're going to see how, <coughs> excuse me, how they responded to Jesus here in these last few days. And I think we're going to walk away with some very real points of application. How can you and I apply ourselves to this passage as we notice how his disciples reacted, how his disciples submitted how his disciples interacted with Jesus. I don't have to tell you this. If you've been around the word of, word of God for any amount of time, the disciples did not always get it right. In fact, I think we can find in just about every single person who is mentioned in Scripture, we find somewhere, even though they may be mentioned in one of the most positive lights possible in Scripture, they did not always get it right. But generally speaking, a disciple of Jesus Christ, it was true of these disciples we're going to look at today, and it's true of those who choose to truly follow Christ today. Generally speaking, Jesus' disciples display a response of submission to Jesus. That word submission is not a word that many are fond of. Nobody likes to submit themselves to somebody else. Or something else. We like to be our own person. We like to do our own thing. But if you were to put a definition to this word submission, it is the idea of placing one's self under the ideas, leadership, and direction of another. Let me say that again. Submission is the idea of placing oneself under the ideas, leadership, and direction of another. What made the disciples the disciples? was their heart and actions of submission as they followed Jesus. And so as we cover most of the remaining sections here in Luke 22, we're going to take a look at the message entitled Submission to Jesus. And I want you to ask yourself today, seriously, I want you to ask yourself, what does my submission to my Savior look like today? Let's pray, and then I want to look very quickly this morning at three very real parts of submission to Christ as we see in the example of the disciples. Father, this is not my message per se. This is your word. It is not my words that have power. It is your words that are stronger than any two-edged sword, that have the ability to pierce through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, that have the ability to just dig deep down into the dark recesses of our soul and determine the thoughts and intents of our heart. And Father, I pray that today your word would have its free work and moving in each one of our lives. May we remove any sort of resistance or blockade to your spirit using your word to penetrate our hearts today. I pray that as we take a look at this idea of submission to Jesus, that we would ask ourselves, what does our own submission look like? What does it need to look like? How would a response from us most honor and glorify you, our Father? Help us with this passage, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, first of all, as we look at three parts of submission to Christ seen in the disciples, I want you to notice there is a very real element of faithfulness. Faithfulness is number one. Take a look. You're in Scripture in Luke chapter 22. 
I want to read aloud as you follow along. Maybe you click on your device or maybe you turn in your hard copy of the scriptures to Luke 22, starting in verse 7. The Bible says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he, that's Jesus, sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water, following him, uh, follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. The disciples here displayed an inward and outward faithfulness to their Lord. The disciples, they, they responded with obedience. I want you to notice here just two things I want to highlight from this section. Their inward faithfulness came first of all through a submissive attitude. We see faithfulness in their attitude toward the Lord. It says in verse 9, they said to him, where wilt thou that we prepare? So the picture here is it, it's Passover time. It is time to go and set up uh, what would happen every year, the Passover meal. And Jesus instructions, instructs his disciples, go and set up the Passover. And they look at him and say, okay, we'll do that. But where would you like us to do it? They could have looked around. I mean, they had been now with Jesus for three and a half years. They had been uh, around the Jewish religion for much longer than that. And they could have looked around and found a suitable place in their own opinion to eat the Passover meal. But instead, what did they do? They asked Jesus where he wanted to partake of the Passover meal with them. They could have looked at what seemed convenient to them in their own thinking, but they deferred to the Lord. There is a great need amongst Christians today to get back to deferring to the Lord. You know what it means to defer, right? Not my will, but thine be done. That is probably the greatest example of deferral I've ever heard of. That's Jesus saying to the Lord, it's not about me, it's whatever, Father, you want. Well, deferral in our lives, deferring to the Lord, displays itself in, Lord, here I am. Do with me, in me, and in my life and in my circumstances how you see fit to do. You are the creator, you are the master, you are the savior, you are the sustainer. You do what you desire to do in my life. That is deferring to the Savior. I think we see a great lesson from the disciples' deference to the Lord. We, I believe, should be doing a lot less that just makes sense to our own thinking and a lot more seeking the Lord as to what He would have us to do as laid out in His Word. There are clear principles for every part of life laid out in the principles of God's Word. But we often neglect them. We often put them aside and say, what do I feel like doing? What do I want to do? What should uh, I do based on what makes sense to me? But how often do we go to the Lord in his word and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? How can I most trust you, Lord? How can I do what would most be in line with the principles of your word? Proverbs 21, verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. I hardly ever meet a person, myself included, who doesn't think that my way is the right way or their way is the right way. We all think our way is the right way. But I'll tell you every single time how you can determine if your way is the right way. If it lines up with what God says in his word. If you cannot line up your way with God's word, then I would not, if I were you, I would not be very adamant about standing on my way. 
Because every way seems right unto a man, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. The, the only sure st standing for a believer to go forward is upon the principles and teachings from God's word. Period. There are a lot of examples in scripture when people did that which was right in their own eyes. And often we see very clearly that it led to destruction. Beware of doing it which in a way that is right in your eyes. Whatever it is, right? Whatever decision you're facing. May we do a lot more asking of God what he would have us to do instead of what we want to do. So we see there was a very real submissiveness in their attitude, but also in their actions. Look at verse 13. It says, and they went and made ready the Passover. When Jesus had their heart, or their attitude as we just talked about, he got their actions. When Jesus has our attitude, he gets our actions, our obedience. Psalm 119 verse 2 says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart, with, their whole, with the, the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. I think we could say it this way. Walking for God is the natural result of walking with God. Think about that. Walking for God is the natural result of walking with God. You see, when God gets our heart, he gets our obedience. And so as we think about giving the Lord our actions, our obedience, how can you and I be faithful in our attitude and actions today? Well, one way, I'll give you two. One, I think, is soaking. Soaking. You can jot that down if you'd like to. Psalm 119 Verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. One of the greatest need for believers today is to hide God's word in our hearts. That word hide means to treasure, to hold on to, to embrace. Let me ask you a question. Does that describe your pursuit of God in his word? In other words, it's, I, I'm, I've been reading in Proverbs here in the last several days, and the, the first four or five chapters are all about embracing and seeking the wisdom of God. Does that describe your pursuit of God's word, his way, his will, his, his, his principles? Are you seeking them? Are you embracing them? Are you holding on to them? Or is it, well, whatever comes will come? Is it, well, I've got, my, I've got these things to do in my life and maybe I'll get to God's word at some point. No, if we're going to give God our heart, which gives God our actions, we must be hiding his word in our hearts. We must be soaking it in. Are you spending time, at least some time, soaking in who God is from his word? One of the saddest realities is that if we were to take a, a dead-level truth survey today amongst believers such as even our crowd here today, I wonder how dismally low the time actually spent with God and His Word really would be. We have got to be soaking in God's Word. Why? That's how we get to know who God is. If we're to be following and submitting to our Savior, we need to know who we're following and submitting to. We don't just blindly follow. We follow by faith in what we see in God's Word. So we need to be soaking, but the natural progression from soaking in who God is from His Word is, second of all, it's up on the screen as well, sharing. Sharing. Psalm 119 verse 13 says, With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. Can I ask you a question? Are you in the habit or even have the intentionality to share God's word, the gospel with those God has placed around you? Why is it so important to develop a discipleship culture in a church like Hudson View Baptist Church? It's for that very reason right there, to proclaim the word of God, to teach the word of God, to, to help others walk according to the word of God in a discipleship type relationship. 
I think for far too long, we as believers have hidden behind the excuse of I don't know how. Well, did you know how to accept Christ when it came time to realize your sin, the greatness of your Savior, and the incredible promises that come along with accepting Christ as your Savior? Of course you did. You said, I need that. I want that. Well, it's as simple as sharing that, that same truth with those God has placed around you. What are some tools that you can use to do so? Well, fresh out of COVID jail is our track rack in the back. That was another joke. It's bad when I have to tell my jokes. That just means they're not funny, and I know that. Um, but there are several things back there in the track rack that I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with. Take some with you. That's why we have them. That's why we spend money on these things is to use them. We have just some simple tools. Maybe, maybe there's someone you like to invite to church, right? And we have some, some simple ones that just say, like on the front, you are invited. Or be my guest this Sunday. And on the back side has the gospel in, in detailed format from various passages of scripture. It also has our church contact information, our service times and such. We have a couple others. This one says, for God so loved the world, has the gospel also on the back. This one, I like this one. It says, finding the way to eternal life. And on the back side actually has a pictorial presentation of the gospel, a simpler presentation um, that really could be used with anybody. These are tools that you can use in reaching those that God has placed around you. You don't have to wait for a door-to-door -door announcement of outreach at your church. You can outreach right now, today, in your sphere of activity. In fact, I would submit to you, you should be. You should be reaching out to those God has placed around you. He has placed you right where you are for a reason. And one of those reasons is to reach souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the things that is my heart for this church and I believe is the Great Commission is to develop a discipleship culture in our church. And that discipleship is not just having a Bible study with someone in the church. Discipleship is praying evangelistically for somebody that's in your sphere of activity, praying that they would come to know Christ through your interaction with them, through your sharing of the word of God with them, and then leading them down this journey of discipleship. We have something on the back table that is also new this week. Um, it's called Your Disciple-Making Your Disciple -making Journey, Practical Steps for Being and Making Disciples. Now, on the inside, you're going to find some very familiar resources. On Wednesday nights for, I guess, the past three years or so, we have been going through uh, discipleship resource after resource after resource, building a discipleship journey for you to lead somebody else down. And so when you open it, you'll see, first of all, your new life in Christ. Then you'll see foundational truths, and you've got three resources there that you can begin to walk somebody through as maybe you've led them to Christ, or perhaps they already know Christ but need to grow in Christ, which we all do. Um, one is called Foundations. That's the very first one. Then there, the next one is called The Walk, Every Spiritual Growth. And then the next one is Life in the Father's House. What does it mean to, to interact in the Father's House, the church? And then there are other church, uh, uh, Christian growth and Christian living resources that you can systematically walk through. Now, this is not designed to sit down in 12 weeks and go through with somebody. This is a lifelong journey. You'll notice on the second page it says, win one and lead one. Win one, pray to find, uh, pray to see one friend come to Christ and lead every believer, uh, lead one by every believer discipling another. And so it's a lifelong commitment. And I would encourage you to take a look at that plan right there. It gives you a skeleton by which you can start to hang your discipleship efforts on. It, it, discipleship, please don't misunderstand what discipleship is. Discipleship is not a 13-week study and you're done. Discipleship is a lifelong journey. It is living life with somebody else, teaching along the way, also receiving along the way what it means from God's word to live in submission to Jesus Christ. It's a lifelong thing. I think we've really gotten ourselves away from what it means to be disciples and to make disciples. We must get back to a commitment to lifelong discipleship. There's also one more resource, and I'll be done and I'll, I'll move on. Making the most of every opportunity, ideas for personal evangelism. There's these little bookmarks back there on the, also on the back table. It talks about 
uh, how you can strengthen friendships redemptively and pointing those that you know to Christ through those relationships. Civic groups, whether it's library, volunteer, YMCA, neighborhood relationships, giving Christmas gifts and, and, and walking in your neighborhood, inviting neighbors to birthday parties, that type of thing. Shops and restaurants and some ideas on what you can do there. Uh, schools and what you can do in your children's school situation. Uh, coworker relationships, what you can do amongst your coworkers. There's some practical ideas here, and I hope you'll avail yourself of that. Listen, church, we have to get off of our seat, and we have to be involved in discipleship. That's the Great Commission. That's what we heard about from these guys who went to Nicaragua. But it's not just a trip to go on. Discipleship is a lifelong journey for every single believer. And if you're not on board with that, you're not on board with Jesus Christ. As I know that sounds harsh. You say, Pastor, isn't that a little hard on a Sunday morning? That's just truth. If we're not on board with helping those that God has placed around us to know him and to grow in him, then what are we doing, really? What are we doing? What are we consumed with that is taking us away from that? And I, I dare say, if you're consumed with something that is taking you away from discipleship, you're on the wrong pursuit. So we see the disciples were submitted to Jesus with a response of faithfulness to him. But notice they were also privileged to have, number two, a very special participation. Take a look at verse 14. <clears throat> Luke 22, verse 14 says, And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. These guys were participating in something historic. And I won't spend a lot of time here, but sufficient to say this was the last Passover meal because the last Passover lamb was getting ready to be sacrificed once and for all for the sins of mankind. That was Jesus himself as God's Passover spotless lamb who was going to be shedding his blood for the remission of the sins of all of mankind. This was historic. They were getting to participate in the last ever needed Passover meal. You see, there wouldn't need, be a need for any more Passover sacrifice because he, Jesus, is the sacrifice, the all-sufficient sacrifice. There's the old hymn that says, once for all, Jesus died once for all so that you and I can be eternally secure in God, in his righteousness through faith in Christ. See, why did that have to happen? Well, because sin entered the human race so many years ago through Adam and Eve, and by heredity and by choice, passed down to every man, woman, boy, or girl ever since. And so Jesus came as God's solution to reconcile sinful man to God, a holy God, who cannot be touched with sin. And so his solution was sending his son to die in your place and my place as that once and for all Passover lamb. This is important, guys. This is a big deal. I mean, you can, you can fall asleep. You can drift off. You can, but this is a big deal. The Passover lamb of Jesus Christ is what it's all about. Participation in that is an eternally transforming issue. Jesus is very clear, though, that not everyone is a participation in this salvation. He said in verses 21 and 22 that there is someone here in my midst who is going to betray me. Woe unto that person. Can I ask you a very personal pointed question? Are you a participant of this salvation that is offered by Jesus or are you in the same boat of that one who is going to betray Jesus? And by the way, you don't have to betray Jesus to be in that same, uh, that same category of condemnation. You simply just have to reject him. 
The Bible says that salvation is not automatic. It's not applied to every person. The Bible says it must be personally received by each individual if it is to apply to them. Have you ever placed your trust for salvation in Jesus Christ alone? That is the greatest, most glorious decision you'll ever make. Don't put it off. If you're already a believer, how do, you re- how do you respond to that? Rejoicing is a wonderful response to the privilege of participation. Maybe simply you need to say today, Lord, thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for saving my soul. If you are in need of Christ, today is the day. Today is the day to accept Christ. Don't put him off any longer. Let us take the word of God at the conclusion of this service. I, Pastor Josh, anyone else here in our church would love to open the word of God and show you how you can make the greatest, most eternally transforming decision you'll ever make. Don't put it off. Well, we're talking about submission. And I told you there were three points. And I want you to notice that the disciples certainly struggled with number three, imperfection. These closest followers of Jesus, I mentioned earlier, did not get it right all the time. I'm so glad that God doesn't call us to perfection because Jesus Christ was the only one who could secure that perfection. He simply calls us to faithfulness. Proverbs 24, 16 says, A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. God doesn't call us to perfection. He calls us to faithfulness, to keep on going. What are some of the things that they struggled with? Real quickly, I don't have time to spend here uh, real long, but they were accusatory, first of all. You remember he said, hey, someone's going to reject me. And in verses 22 through 30, I won't take the time to read all those verses right now, but they started looking around and like, who is it? Who's going to reject Jesus? And then the conversation shifts over to who's the greatest among us? Who, I mean, can you imagine? Jesus just gave them the, the opportunity. He, 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 he demonstrated the greatest participation ever, eternally speaking, and now they're worried about who's the greatest. Isn't that just like us? Instead of focusing on the Savior, we're focusing on self and those God has placed around us and their imperfections. That was a struggle for them. Jesus goes on in the following verses in 23 through 30 to say, by the way, if you're with me, you have a participation in a kingdom that this world will never get close to knowing. Just rest in me. Don't worry about who's going to be greatest. It's not about that. It's about the kingdom. And that's a big deal. They also were deceived. In verses 31 through 34, Peter vows to the Lord that even if it meant dying for Jesus, he would never deny him. And we obviously know in that story what happened, right? He denied the Lord three times. And it says here in this passage that after the third time, he looked over, Jesus looked over at him and, and immediately Peter knew. It's like, oh, yep, I just did it. And he, the Bible says he wept bitterly. But he was deceived in thinking he was better than he was. He was stronger than he was. He was deceived in thinking, I've got this. Listen, friends, we don't got this. God's got this. And I know that's not good English, but it doesn't matter. God has this under control. We do what we do as believers in his power, not in our own power. Don't be deceived in thinking you can handle this. It's not about you. They were also vulnerable. In verses 35 through 38, you remember leading up to this point that Jesus basically told them, don't worry about preparing and and bringing all this stuff on your journey. Just, Just trust the Lord. He'll provide it along the way. People will take care of you along the way. Be vulnerable. I will take care of you. Well, this was no exception. Only now it wasn't stuff that they needed to trust the Lord for. It was the fact that they needed to trust the Lord for Fighting the battles. In fact, at the end, of, I think it's in verse 38. Um, Let's go there. Verse 38. They said, Lord, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it's enough. Had it come down to this? Basically, I mean, two swords amongst 12 people wasn't going to do a whole lot, right? They were vulnerable. There were battles coming up. And if you know history, you know that they faced tremendous battle over the next several years. And 
the Lord was to be the one to fight those battles. They were vulnerable, but they were also distracted. In verses 39 through 46, and in the parallel passages, specifically in Mark 14, we see Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he tells them, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And between those two passages, both in Mark 14 and Luke 22, what do we see happening? They fall asleep. They fall asleep. All he did was ask them to watch and pray, but they were tired. Now, I don't blame them. They had been through some intense struggles up until this point. I believe it was probably pretty late at night. I don't blame them for having the desire to fall asleep. But you know, there are times where we can get distracted by what our flesh wants instead of looking to the Lord and what he's instructed us to do. Don't be distracted. Not, sleep is not a bad thing. I love sleep. You love sleep. We need sleep. Often it's been said a rested Christian is a spiritual Christian. You don't believe me? Just take someone who is deprived of sleep and be around them for any amount of time, and there's not a whole lot of spirituality flowing from their lips, right? That's just kind of how it is. But you know what? Following our own desires, following our own feelings, following what comes easy to us, can get in the way of our submission to Christ. Maybe it's desires, maybe it's dreams, maybe it's devotion to work, maybe it's a desire for things to be back to normal, right? That's the big talk. Let's get things back to normal. But are you worshiping the desire to get back to normal? Or are you submissive to what God wants in your life? Are you, are you worshiping what you see is best for going forward in whatever situation in life? Or are you submissive to the Lord as to what he sees is best? Lord, I, I want it to be this way, but nevertheless, not thy will, but not my will, but thine be done. There is the Christian life. It's submission to whatever God wants. Don't let the things of this life distract you from Jesus and his mission for you. I want you to notice, finally, these guys found themselves to have a deserting spirit. I don't mean eating ice cream and cake. You got the joke this time. It took three times, but you got the joke. Anyway, no, seriously, they were deserting. They left Jesus. If you were to read verses 54 to 62, you'll read about Peter flat out denying that he even knows Jesus. Three times. If you read the parallel passage in Mark 14, the other disciples, it says, forsook him and fled. You know, if we're not careful, we can be tempted to flee from our Lord when life heats up. You don't believe me? You ever been embarrassed about your faith? It's happened to all of us. Oftentimes religion, especially, especially biblical Christianity, is ridiculed and ostracized. I mean, even this week I saw on, on two television shows, just flipping through the stations, two television shows in the course of like two days where church and pastors and, and Christianity was not painted in a pos positive light. Uh, a light. That, that was just in prime time regular TV. It's all around us. It happens at work. It happens in today's educational institutions. And often the easiest thing to do is to dodge and forsake Christ in that moment. These guys did eventually get back to following him, but they really struggled with submission when it came to sticking with Christ. Maybe you find yourself struggling a bit right now with submission to Christ. Remember, God does not call us to perfection but he calls us to faithfulness. Maybe it's time today to humbly return to faithfulness in your submission to our Savior. And I end by asking you this question as I asked you earlier. How's your submission to Jesus Christ today? Maybe you've never submitted to him in the first place for salvation, and you need to start right there today. You see, you can't submit to Christ until you first accept Christ. And maybe today you need to accept Christ. And please don't leave here without, without us Open, let, allowing us to open God's word and show you how you can accept Christ. But maybe you're a believer today and you've gotten away from submission to Christ in some area or another, and I won't rehash all those areas, but perhaps your need is to ask the Lord himself to help you to renew that submission to him. For it's only in his grace that you can do it. It's only in his power that you can submit to Christ. I just encourage you today, Whatever it is that God's knocking on the door of your heart about, you would just submit to it.
Amen? Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would, first of all, in our midst, if there is somebody who does not know Christ, that you would give them the courage and the humility to call out to you, asking for your forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ. I pray they would do that today. They would not delay. But Father, I also pray for those of us who are believers in whose lives the battle and the struggle is very real. I pray that you'd help us in this submission to you, whether it's submitting to you for a decision that needs to be made, whether it's submitting to you in the circumstances for which we have no answers, whether it's submitting to you in relationships, whatever it is, help us, Lord, to realize you are bigger than that. You can fight the battles that need to be fought. You can provide where provision is needed. You can work out details in ways that we never thought possible. Help us, Lord, to simply respond with a spirit of submission instead of resistance to you and your work in our lives. Father, I pray that today you would help us with this in a very real way for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.